Um, a few more thank yous before we begin, if you'll oblige me. First, thank you to the School of Architecture for inviting me to join you this year and this evening. I'm honored to serve as your distinguished visiting professor. Thank you to my Chicago Studio students and co-professor Dr. Bliss, who this semester are helping lead the important conversation about the future of housing. Thank you also to my Kaler Slater colleagues who continually strive to create design solutions that move us, our industry, and our clients forward. Lastly, I'm honored to be here as an alum of the School of Architecture, where many years ago now, I was a thesis student with Professor Dearborn considering the future of housing. That work and that exploration are still ongoing, but I'm happy to report we are getting closer to a future that we were imagining then. Where are we now? 2020 has been a hard year. We're confronted with a three-part crisis, climate, health, social. There is a fog blocking our thinking. It is hard to see where we're going. What can we do? Like many of you, I asked myself, how can I help? What can I do? From my quarantine home office, I thought deeply about my role and the role of architects in this three-part crisis. I came to this obvious conclusion. Design matters. We know this. We know that as architects, we have the ability to think critically, to problem solve, to shape our environment. We can do hard things. As a generation, we are more technologically advanced than any prior. We are armed with the tools to move fast and be nimble. Super user students, like many of you on this call, can lead this charge. We are not returning to the life that we left in March of 2020. We will have fundamentally changed from this current disruption. And when we stop and evaluate the world we left, there were parts of it that were not working well for everyone. As placemakers, we now have, now have the opportunity and the responsibility to design a better future. Let us use this moment of disruption for good. Harness its power. While the scale of this disruption is growing larger each day, it is certainly not the first time our profession has faced these moments. Disruptions cause change. Let us use that change for good. How did we get here? Let's take a look at other disruptions and the impacts, both positive and negative, they had on the built environment. We can begin with the Industrial Revolution, a time of great advancement and innovation. Environmentally, that advancement was a challenge. Working and living conditions were difficult. Where did people live? Mostly in crowded tenements and cities. Enter the Spanish flu of 1918, the first pandemic disruptor. We see many similarities of our current pandemic to this moment in time. How did that affect where people live? Pre-pandemic, the first luxury apartment building was marketed in New York City. However, the lower floors were considered the most desirable. Upper floors were served by the new invention called the elevator but were still considered unsafe by many. Following the Spanish flu, we see a change in technology. Elevators are improved and are now safe. It's the roaring 20s and penthouses become fashionable. A logical response to being up in the fresh air, away from the busy and now perceived unhealthy streets below. This was a major shift in housing thinking. Concurrently in the 20s, we had advancement in building materials. Walter Gropius invented the curtain wall. We see it beginning to appear in Europe and the US. Conveniently, air conditioning was also invented at this time. We could now build fully enclosed and mechanically conditioned spaces. A major disruptor happened to our progress. 
the Great Depression, mass unemployment, the Federal Housing Authority was created. We see the start of public housing. Shortly after, we see the beginning of redlining by lenders. The impacts are still felt today. The end of this era was spurred by the New Deal and the WPA, building infrastructure which still stands in many of our cities today, including parts of Chicago's Lakeshore Drive. The 30s were hard. Just as we were recovering, another major dis disruptor affected the whole world, World War II. The aftermath of that war meant we needed to rebuild all over the world. In Europe, the rebuilding was typically mid or low rise, but one of the great thinkers gave us his plan for the radiant city and buildings as a machine for living. In the US, we were not rebuilding, but expanding. And the desire to welcome home the returning GIs, we gave rise to the suburbs. Buoyed by the popularity of the automobile, people moved in droves to newly built suburbs. This became the picture of the American dream, so much so that it is still very much the perception of where families live in America. We started to see the introduction of the open floor plan at this time as newly built homes were marketed. Enter the late 1960s. With the energy crisis, social inequity, and political polarization, this era feels much like the challenges we are facing today. With the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Chicago erupted. Fires burned the vibrant communities of our city's west side. Those neighborhoods have not yet fully recovered. Our city was hurting very much like the way our city is hurting today. But something else was happening in our city in 1968 and 1969. Engineers and architects were learning how to build taller with steel. While disruption occurred all around them, these minds were focusing on building something new. SOM led the charge. By 1972, the Sears Tower rose like a beacon of hope in Chicago. The John Hancock Building and many residential towers joined. These were times of great advancement in building technology and new ways of thinking. Much of our cities were built taller during this time. People moved into glistening new high rises and called them home. Also popular during this time was Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. She reminds us that designing a dream city is easy. Rebuilding a living one takes imagination. Her words echo in my head today. By the year 2000, the disruptor was climate change. We saw the effects of the melting ice caps and carbon emissions. LEED was founded and invented. In his book, Cradle to Cradle, Bill McDonough urged us to stop trying to be less bad and start trying to be good. In this refocusing on climate, we see the rise of new urbanism in the US and Europe. Walkable mid-rise communities are seen throughout both continents. Something else happened. The internet became accessible to all. In marketing new homes and apartments, three out of four living spaces are now marketed as luxury units. And now, here we are in 2020. Where you live today is shaped by this history. In order for us to move forward, it is important to know where we have been. As an architect, you design for the present with an awareness of the past for a future that is essentially unknown. Let's talk about that future. It's a future that we can shape. It became clear during the pandemic that housing has never been more important. Many people have been quarantined in their homes for months, evaluating the way that home works or doesn't for the new perceived normal. We are in a paradigm shift. Recognize that shift, embrace that shift. 
The places that people call home must now perform as they have never performed before. They must now concurrently support live, work, learn, and play all under one roof. What does it look like when all of those activities happen at once? For most, it hasn't been an easy transition. How can we design an environment where everyone thrives? And can that solution be adaptable to all scales? Today, we will fo focus on multifamily living, but it also applies to single family homes and to the varying scales and types of apartments you find in cities, from historic and low rise buildings, mid rises and high rise apartments at their core they all support people in the choices of where and how they live. We must also apply the principles of designing for community, wellness, and sustainability in our conversation. One of the great things about architects is our ability to work in different scales. We can consider not only the detail of the unit, the massing of the building, and also the urban design and these larger principles of design quality and equity. Let's begin our conversation tonight with the most quintessential unit in multifamily housing, the split two. How did this become the basic building block of mid-rise multifamily housing? The car, really. Five parking stalls plus half a drive aisle equals a two bedroom unit. It's efficient planning. It takes into consideration the desire for parking and it's built upon our still conceived idea that most of the units we design are one or two bedroom apartments. For the purposes of our conversation this evening, we have a very diagrammatic plan. The split two is exactly what it sounds like. Two bedrooms and two bathrooms split on either side of open plan living spaces, one predominant solar orientation. Now, let's put this unit into the 2020 machine. Can this unit support concurrent live, work, learn, and play? Two partners on unrelated Zoom calls? What about an e-learning student? Throw in a pet coworker for some extra chaos. What we are all discovering is that open plan living means no acoustic separation from li living needs, like making lunch and simultaneously having a work from home Zoom call happening in the living room. No defined space means that everyone is vying for a location for their work or schooling. Someone moves their work from the table each day and feels no permanence. Perhaps you never realized how loud your new coworker was just going about their day. It's causing tension and a careful balancing act of who is zooming when and juggling calendars. If you're lucky enough to be able to fit your now work or school from home desk in your bedroom, you have some acoustic separation, but now the place where you rest is also the place where you work. Are we working from home or are we living at work? It's clear that we need mental separation in our lives for balance. Okay, let's just add a walled space. Remember, it's likely desirable to keep the unit the same size without adding square footage. You could add a room in the middle of the open plan. This doesn't seem like the right use of space. What we need is a flexible space in our units that allows the user to define how it functions. How can we do that if we keep the same square footage? Let's reconsider the ensuite. By utilizing the space of a former walk-in closet, we're able to create flexible user-defined spaces. Doors provide access to light and visual connectivity when needed, but are closed for acoustic separation and focus. In a flex space, just 48 square feet, we are able to accommodate a myriad of needs. Imagine it's your home office, a dedicated location for all your equipment, not in your bedroom, acoustically isolated, and you don't have to move your laptop off the dining room table to eat dinner. You can also have a proper desk chair. Working from the dining room chair is not good ergonomics and doesn't lead to wellness. 
when you're done, you can just close the door and walk away. Mental separation. When we're on the other side of this pandemic, we expect a hybrid work from home solution to continue. Many people will work from home at least part of the week. We need to better accommodate that in our housing solutions. The other thing this unit starts to do is consider the sanitization path. Whether an essential worker is simply returning home, the ritual of hand washing will remain prevalent going forward. This diagram takes into account coming in the front door with a bathroom immediately available. If you're a healthcare worker, you can wash your laundry, shower, and change clothes all before joining the people in the living spaces. Expect this to be a concern moving forward. In this plan, you'll see we are able to accommodate two flex spaces. How would you flex? The beauty of this idea is that it's up to the user. Home office or e-learning is a logical first thought. But what about a private gym or a play space for children? I know plenty of artists and musicians who would enjoy a space for their craft. Acoustically treated walls and proper lighting mean these flexible spaces support many needs. We're forgetting something, access to green space. The pandemic closed the parks. Our food supply was in question, anxiety was high. Green space is critical to all of these needs. As designers, we've been part of the trend to make smaller and smaller units with shared green spaces. In some cases, they're not private green spaces at all. Let's push for the reintroduction of the private balcony, one that's sized appropriately for access to light and air and activity. We could imagine a loja running the length of the apartment, accessible from both the living rooms and the bedrooms. It would provide much needed natural ventilation and an indoor-outdoor circulation path, somewhere to grow plants for beautification or for food production. The challenge is you can't really live on a loja. The long proportion limits its use, it is also a considerable amount of square footage. Let's review the goals. Usable green space for outdoor dining long into the colder months. Maximizing natural air circulation for healthier indoor air quality. And if possible, a circulation path for a stir crazy adult or child in quarantine whose parks and lake lakefront trails are closed. Let's push the proportions of the unit to provide a balcony as an outdoor room. We've now created a unit with two flex spaces, a sanitization path, access to outdoor space, and more light and air. Let's review how these balconies work when grouped on a building. You can see the typical attached balconies, somewhat flexible for living, still separated from the neighbors. The loja, much more access, increased circulation, connected to your neighbors, not truly functional. And then the inset balcony, which creates more options and more corners depending on how you stack it. And I can hear my developer and lender friends on the call, cost more money. When designing in school or practice, it is important to stop and ask yourself why. What if we looked at this another way? Why is the corner the most desirable. It's easy, more light, air, and views. What if we applied this to the corner too? The same benefits plus more light and air. Why start with a double loaded corridor? Why be connected to the car? What would be an option if we were connected to another mode of transportation? I don't think there's time on this call to discuss all of those but I encourage you to ask the questions in your studios and your office and begin the conversation about why. How do we get more corner units? We add more balconies or we split the building into boutique buildings on a podium. If we split the building, we now have room for shared amenities on the podium level and the rooftop, or we can utilize the rooftop for solar collection. There's no one size fits all answer, but we have to ask ourselves 
why do we keep pushing amenities to the shared roof deck besides the view? We are removing the users from the streetscape. As we think about how to design for community, it's not just the community inside the building, but also how the residents of the building interact with their streetscape and their neighborhood. Utilizing a podium amenity level adds more green opportunity at the roof and the podium and better connects to that community. We can explore the use of covered or partially covered spaces at this level. Herbs and Horto, city in a garden. This is the motto of Chicago. Chicago is rightfully proud of their number of green roofs, the park system, the lakefront, and Lurie Gardens seen here. New York City has Central Park and the High Line, but what happens when the pandemic closes these spaces? We have segregated our green space. We've only relegated it to the public sector and we haven't give, given all neighborhoods and all neighbors equal access to it. We know the benefits of green space on the environment and the resident. It's been well studied. Let us push to incorporate more green space into our buildings, balconies with planters, roof decks, green roofs, green walls. All buildings make cities. Let us push to be true cities in a garden. Let's have a quick look at amenities. Multifamily residential buildings have been upping the amenity game for years. Gyms and pools are now standard. Package room, co-working, working. we even have a space for the dog. But have we forgotten anyone? What about children? Do they live in multifamily housing? Or are we still so hung up on the American dream of moving to the suburbs that we have forgotten? Children also live in our buildings and our cities. And seniors live in our buildings and our cities. We are not just catering to young, childless professionals when we design. Going forward, let's consider all users. This is a way to build better community and diversity where we live. Work and learn from home will continue in some fashion. We should plan to accommodate this in building amenities and provide private video conferencing or e-learning rooms. They could be reservable by the day, the month, or the school year. We see the desire for prep meals and meal service provided within multifamily buildings. Providing access to green space allows residents to grow some of their own food if they wish, or simply enjoy the benefits of nature. The desire for outdoor entertaining and longer seasons is going to remain strong and our amenity spaces should accommodate this goal. Some emerging trends. We need to continue support concurrent activity. Live, work, learn, and play all in one roof. It's not gonna go away. Flexible user-defined spaces that allow any family to use their space as they see fit. In addition to better acoustics, we see the request for human-centered lighting to counteract the time inside and the amount of blue light we get from screens. Consider decentralizing the amenities and providing smaller, semi-private space, perhaps even located by floor. We see the rise in concierge services. Instead of going to the fitness center, perhaps the fitness center comes to the user. Or is the fitness center something more universally appealing altogether? A rock wall, swings? It's hard to say what it might become. We've talked already about the importance of green space and private space. Seek ways to cultivate community while distanced. Throughout all of our buildings, we're seeing COVID response already. Increase in HVAC and air filtering, wider hallways and wider sidewalks where our buildings meet the street. An increase in touchless technology, dispatched elevators, keyless entry, at this moment of paradigm shift, it is critical that we seek to rethink, relearn, and reimagine 
how and where people live so that we can better support their needs. At Kaler Slater, we serve multifamily clients nationally. 8,000 units. That's how many residential units our team at Kaler Slater will design and deliver in 2020. 8,000 times for us to think differently about where we are going, to dream big with our clients, and to design, to design spaces where everyone thrives. I can't share confidential work in progress, but I do want to share a few statistics. Each of these projects represents ways we can make a positive impact on the places people call home, one project at a time. In this 45 unit development, we're working with an affordable housing developer who seeks to foster community within the building. Importance was given to equity of green space and views of green space. Continuous balconies provide maximized outdoor connection while a roof deck provides community gathering. This project uses a number of solutions to achieve passive house and net zero status, including solar collection. In this 45 unit adaptive reuse project, we know that an existing building is the most sustainable building because it's already there. We are designing market rate units with flexible layouts, dedicated work areas, and considering the sanitization path within the unit. In a 70 unit luxury residential property, we are designing with COVID resiliency in mind. Flex space accommodates many needs. Sanitization paths and natural ventilation provide resiliency. Balconies are generous and being designed as outdoor rooms. Green roofs cap the building. Concierge amenities are being developed. This 170 unit mixed income development puts live work units center stage with direct access, double height spaces. They are setting the trend for the future of work from home. Increasing in scale at 350 units, this luxury tower offers flexible units and dedicated work locations. Maximized balconies provide outdoor spaces. Podium, community spaces, and concierge and wellness amenities are being provided. A 360 unit master plan community is focusing on sustainability and putting an emphasis on connection to nature and healthy lifestyle. Modern design and amenities support a broad range of residents. Here at the University of Illinois, at the School of Architecture Chicago studio, we're considering the future of urban multifamily housing in a post pandemic era. Our students are thinking critically about the impact of housing. We are designing for a city of Chicago and best Southwest site in Inglewood. We've been working closely with city officials and other professionals to shape this new future. I'm delighted to share a little bit of the student work with you now. This project examines access to light and air within housing. This group is thinking critically about ways to bring more light and air into the heart of the building. They recognize that public art is critical and they are re-examining the use of the green roof as a health and wellness component. This team is advocating for maximized balconies as outdoor rooms. They're exploring ways to introduce green space and to be together apart. This project is studying the way architecture builds community. How does the interaction with the ground plane support that goal? Balconies play a large role here too. Similarly, this team is exploring the intersection of third spaces public and private, welcoming the community. Their study of facades is yielding ways to introduce planted material beyond the roof deck. All of the teams are exploring redefining the unit. This example showcases a sanitization path, maximized indoor-outdoor circulation, generous balconies of different sizes, and work pods. This team is exploring the intersection 
of urban agriculture and wellness? How can we counteract a food desert? Perhaps a public-private partnership could help infuse green space in our residential spaces. Imagine this is your walk home. This is a call to action. Whether you have been doing this for two years or two decades, this is the time for us to act, to advocate for better design in the places people live. Equitable design in every building, in every neighborhood. Solutions that promote community, wellness, and sustainability. Ways to provide housing where everyone thrives. The new solutions we seek are in your hands. When confronted with, we've always done it this way, simply ask, why? What can we learn if we look at this from another point of view? Have the courage to see things differently, to be genuinely curious, to engage in conversation, and to invite as many people as you can to contribute to that conversation. Invite the push and pull of ideas. The good ideas will come from that dialogue. Go boldly forward. Be positive disruption. Thank you.